Um, I just want to um, quickly talk about the shirts. Sure. So, yeah, this is view C, view C, view A, B, with just the collar. And then these are, my grandkids have grown out of them. Pretty soon, Emma will be able to wear mm -hmm. these. But these are two of the, the children's, or the, it's called the Youth Easy shirt. And we did put the snaps on these. And these snaps I got from Snap Source, and what I thought was really cool about these snaps is they look like a button. Yeah. They have the four little holes to simulate a button. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of give you some inspiration on making not only adults but children's. And you could even make for, especially for a holiday gift, it'd be great to make a uh, father-son uh, combo. Mother daughter, yeah. mother son. What I for me, I I mean, I like the father son, but for me, like it's the grandfather grandson that's like the real kicker. Yeah. Because like they just the both of usually the grandfather and the grandson they just get a kick out of that. Yeah. Okay, so I go over and you shall go away. away from me. All right, I'm away from you. Oh, good news. I got the word fixed. I got the typo fixed. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe you did it. Oh, I can. I think I might have done it before. I have done it. Yeah, it's so embarrassing. Okay. All right. So, oh, could you hand me the pattern guide? Sure thing, Roo. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. So, um... Everything that we're doing, with very little exception, and there are some exceptions, uh, are in the book. So we are very proud of our booklets because we give you everything. Let's describe it. We give you all the pattern pieces, how to cut it out, and then we go into the interfacing and several cutout pages, but then how to interface. We've got, in the beginning of the book, terms uh technical technological glossary technique glossary and the thing is is we only put in the glossary of each pattern guide the terms that are being used in this guide so many times you get those big fold outs and it's like you have three paragraphs to read and half of it doesn't pertain to the pattern you're making so we try to keep everything to pertain to the pattern we're making here so I'm going to go through the different pieces and what I did to cut them out to make them match. I also wanted to point out, and you could put it in the comments, I think it's on your sheet, the, uh, the directions on how to cut out plaids. I have a video specifically on cutting out plaids, and it, it's just a little short one. It's in tips and techniques on the YouTube channel. Playlist. All right, well, I am looking that up. Um, D Brenda wondered if maybe you wanted to touch on, you know, she sent you that email about the this particular flannel and the feel of it versus, like, this back store. Okay, yep. Yes, um, I did get an email, and someone said, wow, I got my fabric today, and <laughs> it doesn't feel like flannel to me. Why is that? Well, I jokingly wrote back, it feels like flannel to me. <laughs> but the truth is, is that this is a higher quality flannel than you may be used to. So if you've purchased flannels in the box stores or the chain stores, they usually carry a much lighter weight and a lower thread count. So it's far more flexible and yeah, it's a lot softer to begin with, but then it has no body after a few washings. And it can pill because it is not as high quality. So at first, it, this probably feels a little stiffer than you were expecting. But trust me, it, it uh, is flannel and it does soften up, but it'll wear far longer. Like someone said, she made three of them a couple years ago. Jessica, you remember that? Mary yeah. Mary Smith. Mary Smith. And hers are still going strong. And if I would make them for people that didn't grow, mine would still be going. Well, they're still going strong, but no, they don't fit anybody anymore. But 
Um, yeah, this is a very nice quality flannel. So you're going to enjoy this. And it's easier to work with than the more flimsy or lighter weight. And we you know I basically a couple weeks ago touched on fabric weights make a big difference. And so when you look online and you see a flannel that is 3.5 ounces per square yard, and then you come to one like this, and I'd have to double check, but I think this is 5 or 5.6. So you see there's a lot more threads per square inch or per square yard. And so it is a denser fabric, has a greater longevity. Okay, well Jessica's had to take care of the barking dog. Oh, there you are. All right, so let's start with the front. That's what I'm going to cut out first when I'm cutting out a plaid uh, or a check. And... Um, so I'll cut out the left and the right fronts, and I want to match them. So in order to match the center, what we want is this center front line exactly in the same place on the left piece as we have on the right piece. I'm going to turn these around so they're easier for you to understand. All right, so... When I lay these out, I'll lay out, it doesn't matter which one you cut first, left or right, but the, you're going to want them to match. So, okay, I should have these up. All right, so these have already been pressed over, so we can't really, okay. So what I created was the center front is going right down the center of this one line of stripes. And my fold line is right on the edge of that. So that makes it really easy for me when I go to press over the fold line because I don't have to chalk it, I don't have to do anything. When I use the actual stripe of the fabric, then I it's always gonna look straight and there's no guesswork. But the reason I can do that, remember back a couple weeks ago when we talked about yarn dyed fabrics. There's a lot of good reasons to use yarn dyed fabrics. One of them is because the fabric is woven, the yarn is dyed ahead of time, you know what the straight of grain is because that stripe is the straight of grain. So I didn't have to measure the straight of grain on any piece that I cut out today for this shirt because I was able to use the plaid. So that's one great benefit. So then what we want to do is we want to find a center front line where it's going to overlap. And we know it's going to be the center of this dark stripe. So then when I cut out the opposing side, that center front line has to be and it is right on that same line. So that when these two shirts get put together, or these two fronts get put together, you see, everything continues straight across. There's no interruption. The other thing is, is then you've got to make it, make sure that you're doing the same thing up and down. So you want to make sure they not only line up here, and here on the same, in the same place, but here and here. So I always check these different points to make sure they're hitting the pattern in the same approximate area, well, the same area. And sometimes when you've got, especially a flannel, it might, it might be a little cattywampus. So you may have to take the fabric and pull it at a diagonal and give it a few tugs and lay it back down in order to get everything to line up. I did not have to do that on this one. I did have to encourage it a couple of places, but I did not have to do that. The other thing I used were these short and lengthen lines because if I make sure the short and lengthen line is in the same place on the fabric going horizontal, on the right as I do the left that also helps me make sure everything's going to line up nice. So that's how I cut out the fronts. 
Make sure when you cut out the fronts that you mark these little um, notches up here. If you're making a hood, this little notch is for the hooded version you see. Otherwise, we want to nip at the fold lines and the center front line with our little uh, scissors and make a little clip. But you want that clip to be really tiny. Otherwise, if you're uh, scared to do that, then use um, a chalkener to mark that line. But you're going to want to know where that line is. Okay, any questions on the right to left fronts? While you're looking for questions, I'm going to tell you, this is where, if you're making a woman's shirt, this is the only difference. You're going to turn them upside down and cut the right as the left and the left as the right. If you turn them upside down on the right side of the fabric, that will automatically switch it. And you'll be wrapping the right over the left because that's uh, the woman's version. There's no darts. There's no other shaping. You could also, if you wanted a little extra shaping for someone who nips in really nice at the waist, you could just pin fit that after you get the whole shirt done because the absolute last thing you're going to do nearly is the side seam. So I can go on. Mm -hmm. All right. So that uh, that is the right and left fronts. And so then when I go to cut out the back, I take the fronts and confirm that my stripes are again going to match and you can see they're going to match now on this area i don't care if i'm getting a hundred percent even all uh as far as the stripes going this way but it's key to get them going this way it's almost impossible to have both sides match because uh, the math doesn't always work. Maybe you have a two inch grid across, but your back is seven, 17 and, and an eighth inches wide. So you're never going to get a divided exact. So you're never going to get it to match perfect up and down, but you can get it to match perfect going straight across. And you can see that, we'll show you that black and white one from the side over there. And you can see that it looks good rather than having the, uh, what shall I say, Walmart version where the plaid lines up like that. Or actually doesn't line up. So that's all you have to do with the back. But one last thing, nip the very center of the top of the back. There isn't a mark on the pattern. There should be, but there isn't. So what I do is I just fold it in half, and I take my little scissors, and I nip. Just a little nip. And that way I'll be able to line this up with the yoke perfectly. You just stop me if you get any questions, Jess. Okay, so then I'm going to put the back aside because it doesn't have any interfacing. And then I have two other pieces that go with the back, and that's the yokes. So you're going to cut two yokes. You cut one yoke for the facing on the inside on grain. So this goes this way, straight of grain. And you can see it on the pattern piece. So here's your grain line right here. Okay, but we've also added, I added a um, bias cut line. So that we could cut the outside yoke on the bias. And it really helps to do something like that in order to give a break in the pattern where that yoke gets attached. Something a little bit different. So we cut that on the bias. But we cut the facing not on the bias. Because when you cut something on the bias, especially flannel, it's liable to stretch a little bit. So if we don't cut this one on the bias and they're going to be connected to each other, the straight one will help keep the bias one in line. In other words, this is the one we go by. We uh, 
make it fit to that. So Pam is asking to line up the back. Do you set it up by lining it up at the arm side or at the bottom? Both. Or she said and or actually. Yeah, so. both. You want to make sure that it's lining up at both. And if it's not, then that's when you might need to tweak the fabric a little bit. You'll know when it's off just a little bit. You can just either encourage it over there or um, give it that little bit of tug on the bias to get it to line up the way you need it to. Sherry's wondering, would you cut the back yoke on a bias if you're adding a hood? Sure, yeah. Because you still want, well, the hood kind of covers it up, but still. Not if you're wearing it. Yeah, not if you got the hood up. Correct. <laughs> correct, correct. So, yes, I would still do that, but it's not. If I was doing a stripe, I would do the stripe horizontal on the yoke and vertical on the bottom of the back just because I want that break there's a yoke there and unless you can match it perfectly you're going to have uh, you're not going to have any interest so by creating some interest by changing the direction of the print on the yoke compared to the rest of the shirt is how you create that interest and you see that in most shirts most ready to wear shirts um by the way this is not the black and white i just wanted to point this out um, i have two grandsons that live with me and one wanted the black and white and the other one wanted this one and neither one of them wanted the others so the one grandson wants a stark white the other one likes this one which is kind of an off-white and uh gives gray. more gray effect um, but um, um, Sandy is wondering how would you go about lining it to make it an insulated shirt? Well, usually what they do is they underline it. So you would underline it as opposed to lining it if you wanted to give it some extra oomph. But you want there's a lot of things to take into consideration with that including sizing so if you're going to put any loft of anything as a lining in there it's going to make that shirt fit a lot closer and since they most people are wanting to wear these more like a jacket shirt especially the view c with the hood you want to consider that you may need to add a little bit of width or go up a size and that kind of answers Leslie's question, but I want you to expound on it. Is this shirt less fitted than the everybody shirt? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. First of all, there are no darts to be had. It's not meant to be fitted. It's meant to be easy to make and easy to wear. Just a comfortable... Uh, I know Jessica's husband, Eric, he has quite a few of these. And he just likes to wear them on the weekends all the time. Or in, in the house, if they're keeping the heat down, it's a nice shirt. But it's not too heavy. You can wear a t-shirt underneath He wears it, it like a hoodie. Like, yeah. like a zip-up yeah. hoodie. Like instead of, because it's like it looks a little bit nicer than a hoodie. But it does the same thing. Um, you know, he can leave it open or button it up. Yeah. I mean, this shirt can be a dress shirt all the way to a hunting shirt and everything in between. Okay. Um, okay, what's next? Well, the pocket. Now, the pocket pattern is pretty straightforward and self-explanatory, and it does have two different grain lines on it. And I chose to cut this one on the bias. So the pocket's going to sit on here, and you can kind of take a look. Let's see. Is Yes, this would be the side it would go on. Um, but when I cut this on the bias, I interface the entire pocket. If you're not going to cut it on the bias, you only want to interface the full hem. And I mean full hem from the edge right to the fold. So you're going to interface the hem only if you cut it on the straight. But if you cut it on the bias, which is kind of fun, uh, kind of a fun look, then interface the whole pocket with the light and stable. Nothing heavy, just enough to give it a little more body so that it doesn't stretch out while we're putting it on. Okay, 
So that's the pocket. So for a yoke uh, question, kind of. Okay. Uh, or matching of the plaids more, I should say. Uh, Louise wants to know, don't you need to try to match the plaid on the shoulder seams and bottom yoke seam if the yoke is not cut on the bias? Well, good luck with that, and you can do that. It's going to be a lot more time-consuming to get that. And that's why when you see my recipe, recipe for cutting plaids in that tricks and techniques or tricks and tips, the reason that I don't is because then it looks nice and I didn't have to go to the same amount of work. So in other words, when these get attached up here, you can see they're coming in at an angle. You could try to match those, and but it's seldom done. That is not an area, once the seam is made and the top stitching is done, that becomes like, Oh my gosh, they didn't match those plaids. Where you're going to see they didn't match the plaids is straight down the center front and on the side seams. So then I try to fool the eye with cutting a pocket on the bias. And I don't always. Sometimes I cut it straight on. I think I did with the uh, view AB. Um, and, well, there's a couple other pieces that we're going to cut on the bias. The cuffs. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to need a drink of water. <coughs> so I cut, but only the cuffs on the bias. The facing, we cut on the straight. <coughs> For the same reason that we talked about with the yoke. We want something to keep us on track, just in case this stretches a little. It's not likely to because we have uh, a firm interfacing in it which I'm going to get to in a minute. <coughs> so sorry. All right, so when I cut out the sleeves, my trick on cutting out the sleeves is I want my sleeves to be symmetrical. I don't worry about trying to make things match because you could match a plaid in one area, but it's going to be off in another just because of the shape of the sleeve. <clears throat> Unless you take all of the ease out of the sleeve and you do some really special work. And for a shirt, especially this type of shirt, honestly, I don't think it's worth the effort. But I'm not making your shirt. You are. So if it's worth the effort to you and it's kind of a fun puzzle and you enjoy that process, do it. Just do it. So with the sleeve, what I do is I cut one sleeve out and then I take that sleeve and I turn it upside down onto the fabric and I find where I get it completely match. So everything matches. So it'll lay right on there like I kind of can see, let's see, here. You can kind of see what I'm doing here, trying to make it match. And once you get it to match, then you've got a symmetrical sleeve, a sleeve that's the same as the other one, just opposite, because I put them right sides together. And then I cut around them, put the tissue back on, and mark the notches and again we've got <clears throat> your front and back notches and then also a center notch here and these again are marked with little fine lines that's because we take a little nip again if you don't want to take the little nip then mark it with a chalkener or something similar so that's how i make sure that the sleeves look nice that way the sleeves and we're gonna look at that black and white one again because that one was cut this way when you look at it, it isn't like screaming, oh, look, everything matches. But it's also not screaming that the plaid's going across up here on this one and the same down here on that one. Where It's one of those things that a lot of people do not notice if it's right, but you notice if it's wrong. And you're even if you don't know exactly what is not right about it, you're just kind of looking at it like, my eye, what's 
something's wrong. What is it? Or when it's so right, you notice it to be a beautiful shirt. Yeah. Whether you recognize why, you notice it to be a beautiful shirt. So the last thing I think before I get to the interfacing is cutting out the hood. <clears throat> and here's something that a lot of people don't think about. And remember, when we cut out plaids like this, we cut everything out one at a time. We do not cut, fold the fabric in half and cut out two at a time. Because that fabric can shift by half an inch. And then you have this uh, cattywampus effect like with the hood. So when I do a hood, I want the two sides of the hood to be identical. So I made sure that both of these hoods are have the same look all the way down the front. So when this is folded back, they'll look exactly the same vertically and they're going to look exactly the same horizontally. So it just gives a nice symmetrical look to the hood and it doesn't take any time at all to cut it. And you know what I did is I took this darker stripe and I cut right along that stripe and then I set my pattern right up against it. And then I started at the bottom of one of those black squares and so it was really easy to line up the two and make sure that they would be symmetrical. Now this hood gets a centerpiece that goes all the way down the center. Now that again would be very difficult to match because you're going on a curve, right? So we cut that piece on the bias. So this is the piece that will go down the center of the hood. And it gives a really nice effect in the back. So that will be on the bias. And Leslie's asking if the hood is lined. The hood is not lined, but I've given several tips on lining a hood. And I'll be happy to do that when we get to the hood. So if you want to line your hood, what you need to line it with is a very lightweight knit, like a bamboo. But a lightweight knit. You don't want to add a lot of bulk. One of the issues is when we get to that next seam. So that neckline seam, and we're sewing that hood in there, it gets a little bulky, and adding too much weight in lining uh, can make it even bulkier. The other thing is, is you don't want a slippery lining, because then your hood won't ever stay up. So don't ever line your hood with a slippery lining. Um, <clears throat> that's a big no-no. I want you to see, too, that I've taken my chalkener, and I've marked the back side of this fabric. You want to do that as you're cutting. Turn them over. Cut everything with the fabric right side up. It's hard to see that. Yep. Far away. Cut everything with the fabric right side up. Cut everything with all the pieces going in the same direction. Those two things will keep you on track for sure. But always mark it because this flannel, especially if your lighting's just a slight bit off, you're not going to be able to recognize right from wrong. And it may not even make a difference in the end because they are extremely similar. But if you want to stay on track, especially when you've got a right sleeve and a left sleeve, and a right side and a left, right front and a left front, you want to keep that on track. All right, so let's talk about interfacing, and then I'll get to the binding piece. So let's see. What we're going to interface is the front plackets. And there is um, a chart in your book, and on page 11, it shows you the diagram even. But there's a chart on the previous page on how long to cut it. So let's take our right front first. And our right front, I believe this is a two and a half inch piece of interfacing. Yes. Uh, no, maybe two and a quarter. Two and a quarter. So this is two and a quarter. And it's the lightweight interfacing that comes in the kit or the light and stable if you purchase things separately. So you're going to press that down. But cut about an inch off of it at the bottom here. We're going to double turn a hem down here. Hold on, I didn't have you. 
Okay. Answering a question. Is this far enough? Yeah, you're good. All right, so we're going to double turn this hem, and we don't want the interfacing in the hem. So if you cut out between 5 eighths and an inch off of that interfacing before you press it down. Okay, so that's the right front. And this is very similar, this one, as we just did with the everybody's. It's going to be the same kind of button placket. In this case, it's on the left because it's a men's version. So we're going to put a, um, is this one and a quarter, one and a half? These are one and a half. So you're going to have a one and a half inch strip of your light and stable. It's going to go down right along the raw edge of the left front. And again, cut out between five eighths and an inch from the bottom. Then take your medium firm Shirtmakers Express, Shirtmakers interfacing, mm -hmm. and line it right up there. Because this is our fold line. Where these butt together, that's the fold line. So then, after you've adhered it, you're going to press it on that fold line and press it on the second fold line, and then you'll be ready to start sewing next week. All right, and all those directions on where to press, but you've got your fold line, so just press it on the fold lines and set it aside. It'll be ready for stitching. Okay, in the um, cuffs, our cuffs that face the public or the actual cuff on the outside of the shirt gets the shirt makers ex uh, shirt makers uh, medium firm and that is the whole cuff don't cut it away from the seam allowance the whole cuff press it on there the one we cut on the straight of grain that is going to be our cuff facing that's the one we put light and stable on we just want to make it compatible, but we don't want to make it extra stiff. So, light and stable on that one. For those of you who are making the collar version, then it's going to be just like the last sew along we did. The light and stable goes on the under collar or the collar that becomes the facing. The collar gets the firm, the medium firm. Same thing with the collar stand. Medium firm goes on the outside and the facing gets the light and stable. Okay, now the sleeve placket gets interfacing as well. And you're going to see this funny looking piece right here. It's got a hole cut out of it. I've seen some, I had people cut their cuffs like this one time in a class. They came and I'm like, no, that won't work. This is only the interfacing uh, or their stand, their uh, placket. So the placket is a whole piece like that, piece number 11. And then the interfacing piece is number 12 and it has a notch out of it. And that will be obvious why when we get to putting this on. But that's where the whole thing gets folded and it gets really bulky there. So we've cut a little of the interfacing out to make it easier, especially for home sewing machines. And Mary was asking, do, do you cut the corner of the interfacing on the cups? No. The corner, no. No, because the corner on a cuff, Mary, is a square corner, 90 degrees. So we won't have any trouble once we trim that corner for the uh, seam allowance to fit in there. And you want it to fit in there and you want it to be firm. But when you have a collar, the angle is so much more acute that the, the point of that collar is so tiny trying to get that fold, that, the seam allowance folded in there along with the interfacing and everything else it's, you just can't get a nice fine point sometimes. So by just trimming that away from the collar point. So think about it that it's because it is such a sharp uh, angle. Sometimes collars don't have a sharp angle. Uh, I think, well, like on our Islander shirt, it's not a sharp angle. We don't cut the tip away from that one because that's a convertible collar that sits out on the shoulder. It is in a sharper point. Okay. 
Now there's one last piece and I seldom use the actual pattern piece for this. I cut bias a lot. I love using bias for so many different things that I take a piece and I cut a 45 degree angle and make it bias and then I like to use my quilter ruler and instead of using a bias tape which I recommend you not use a bias tape I recommend you use a fine fabric like a lawn this is one of our lawns and it just happened to be the right color combination for this the off-white and the black so I'm just going to cut a one and three eighths to a one and a half inch piece of bias so again I've already dissected this by a 45 degree angle so every time I need a piece of bias from this I just lay my gridded ruler on here and grab my rotary cutter and the piece is I usually just cut a big long piece and I cut it off where uh, I what I don't need at the end when I get to the operation itself so I'm going to keep cutting here And then I'll just set this piece aside. I'm cutting this at one and a half. It might be just a tad wider than I need. One and a three eighths would be good too, but one and a quarter is going to be too short. So then I have my bias strip here. Do not yank on this. I saw somebody in a video one day say, oh, if you cut the bias, give it a couple of good tugs. <laughs> I know. You know what will happen if you do that? the fabric will get thin the strip will be thinner in some places and wider in others because the whole thing is going to shift so don't do that be very gentle with it set it aside with the rest of your pattern pieces um i think that's it just remember that when we have notches in our patterns it's just a little straight line on the edge if you're not used to that it's for a tiny little clip and when you do a tiny little clip in the two opposing pieces come together you know when you're right on as opposed to funny little triangle markings so again if you don't want to clip then use a uh, chalkener or something similar to mark with okay i think that's going to get us ready does that follow my outline because i'm not looking at it did i miss anything <laughs> Make sure you mark center back. You did that. Mm -hmm. You want them always, and you're going to see on the yoke piece too. Thanks, Jess. On the yoke piece, it's going to mark the center, center back, at the neckline, and at the bottom. So, can you see what I'm doing? I can, but they can't. Could you move the camera? Sure. Thanks. So, you want to mark these little, see these little notches. So we're going to just do, um, we'll mark this, whatever way you're going to mark it. But this will help you get either the hood or the collar on symmetrically. This mark will help you get the yoke onto the back symmetrically. So always mark the center back of everything, even though most patterns never do. This is how you just keep things in order and on track. And hanging better that interface piece that you don't use number 18 the one that you personally it's not an interface it or is. I mean the bias I'm sorry yeah, the okay. bias yes yeah. I just spoke wrong yes 18 yeah and it's an, it is an inch and a half wide so you could use it to cut yourself a bias piece or like I said, I just uh, always just cut strips. I've always got a few strips because for uh, Hong Kong finishes and different things like that. But there it is. And that's the length you're going to need. All right. Donna's asking if you said shirt makers medium firm. Yes. She said it a few times. But uh, if there's a specific piece you are asking about. Let us know, but yeah. Yeah, shirt makers. We're not using the extra firm. The extra firm that we carry is for a very stiff formal collar. 
So we're using, and it's a woven. And for many of you, you haven't had the opportunity to, excuse me. Uh, you haven't had the opportunity to use um, a nice, high quality woven interfacing because they just don't carry it. I had a woman call me from Canada yesterday and she was made a beautiful shirt, but she bought her interfacing at uh, a chain store and she was the only thing that went wrong was the interfacing. So I gave her some advice on what we carry um, because this is the same interfacing that better shirt makers use. I know because I went to their source and that's where I get it. Okay. Let's show them the black and white one unless you get more questions. Uh, yeah, Sherry is as, asking if you have thoughts about the pockets for making it as a lady shirt. She says, I'm thinking that I don't want them at bust level, but I love pockets. The, yep. And Sherry, I because the shirt is a loose fitting shirt, having them at bust level is not likely to be a problem. But the best thing would be to do is not wait till the shirt is done, but wait until the shoulder seams are on and set it on your body and audition where you want that pocket. You can put it any place you want that works best for your body. We should know that about all patterns because just because the pattern says this is where you got to put a pocket or this is where you got to put a welt or whatever, if it isn't in harmony with the proportions of your body, then by all means, move it. Josie says she doesn't want it either and she was thinking about putting it in the inseam and then she doesn't have to match the plaid. She's going to put a pocket. Oh, oh, so she didn't have to match the, the plaid. Well, the that's what she doesn't have to match the plaid. Yeah. But I think that that's a bonus because she doesn't want it on the bust, but she wants a pocket. pocket. Yeah, inseam pockets can be added to almost any garment. And a lot of people do it. I think somebody posted just the other day and she did it on one of ours. So, yeah, absolutely. You just have another pattern with that particular pocket shape on it and transfer it to this pattern. All right. So you want to go over and I'll and we'll get a little bit better close up on the um black and white. Yeah. So I think, you know, what I was trying to, you know, remind you of is you see I found I made this my center uh front line which is right between the colorways. And it's the same center front. And then you know exactly where to put your buttonholes and exactly where to put your buttons. It's just, it, plans are just the best friend for a cutter. Okay, so then here's the side seam. And you see, they're not matching this way, but they don't need to as long as they're, I mean, they're not matching this way, but as long as they line up and there is no interruption, it looks nice. It looks purposeful. Um, and I think that's what it's all about. And then on the back, you can see what happens when we cut that center back on the bias. It just gives it a nice look and a yoke on the bias. See what I'm talking about? That interruption between here. If it's the same, it just, eh. But by having this, it gives it a little pizzazz. And let's see those shoulder seams. If that was um, people were asking. So you tell me. I'll try to pull them forward a little bit for you. If that uh, disturbs you or not. It doesn't me. I'm perfectly happy with that. Um, on the sleeve. This one I did not cut the cuff on the bias. I cut it right on the straight. Um, and then here's something that's really hard to believe. But you see this placket. I'm going to tell you a secret. See how it matches? I didn't do it on purpose. It was an accident. <laughs> but I cut both of them out identical, and I cut both sleeves out identical, so it happened on both sleeves. So it looks very purposeful. But you uh, don't cut this on the bias, even if you're looking at my tips and tricks. Because this is cotton flannel, it's going to give a lot. And I worry, especially if this is uh, your first time uh, 
making a shirt like this, you're going to have trouble with it stretching out of shape. While I have this camera turned around, I wanted to zoom in on these buttons that we talked about that are not buttons. Um, these are from the Snap Source, correct? Yes. So these are snaps. This is, um, you can obviously put these on an adult shirt, but Janet used these on the youth version. And look how cute those are. It looks like buttons, but it's actually, I don't know if I can do it one handed. I can't, because they're really nice snaps. It's actually a snap. But for those little people in your life, it's awesome. Oh, I do need to mention one more place that you're going to need to put about an inch of interfacing. And so that would be, if you're making the view C, the hood version, where on the hood pattern it indicates a buttonhole. Because that's where the drawstring goes through, the buttonhole. And you seriously need interfacing behind that buttonhole. And my grandson, I bought him the cutest little hoodie a few months ago. And I go to fold it the other day coming out of the laundry. And they had put eyelets in. And it was a really lightweight fabric with little inner, no interfacing. And they just ripped right out. And their shirt was all but destroyed. I, had, I did a little repair on it. But... Um, it's important that you reinforce that because that does get pulled, especially in the wash and things. So you'll put a little piece of interfacing on there, but not to worry. I'll show you that when we get to that in the sew along. All right, a few questions um, about this, but real quick, um, I forget who it was that was asking me to see some of the um, tropicals. Yep. Okay. Pam, was it Pam? Was it Pamela? Was it neither of those people? <laughs> uh, put in the comments again which ones you wanted to see, and um, I'll see if I can pull them. Uh, Sandy wants to know if you have any gray and red flannel like the no. kids one. No, that's um, old. We have uh, about five left. One is only one piece uh, at the moment. So there's a Dun, dun, dun. They're all beautiful. I'll tell you the one that I, well, the one I'm working on is very pretty and no one has bought that. At all? I don't no, think No, somebody so. has. You said somebody did. Okay, but I have, you know, the better part of a bolt left of that one. And then, um, okay, so this one I have only. No, you don't. No, you don't. Nope, that's don't gone. Sorry. Yelling. She's like, can, very, looking very... I love this. I love this. It's got this really soft, I don't know if it's robin's egg blue or what, but and a gray. Yeah. But it is lovely. And this one, um, there's quite a bit left of. So two or three, four kits maybe in that one. And then... Of course, the buffalo check, there's a little bit of the blue and black left. Love it. I love this one. This one is really bright and fun. And it's uh, strawberry, red, and yellow. And then we have one other red. And this one would be fun to play with because it's a real large scale. Goes this way. So that's very pretty, very fall-like. Oh, Sherry says, wait, don't cut the sleeve placket on the bias. That's correct, Sherry. <laughs> I would not cut the sleeve placket on the bias. It's, I did that on, on this brown and black one back here, and I was really sorry. Mm. It just kind of stretched too much. Got bias crazy. Um, Jillian says she bought that strawberry and yellow one for, uh, oh, good. her daughter. Yeah. So hopefully we can see that. Um, now do we find out what, do so, I, you have recommendations for pre-shrinking? Well, as I told you before, I did my pre-shrink test. And it's in uh, the newsletter maybe three weeks ago, four weeks ago. Some time ago. Yeah. 
and I cut the four inch square. I got it good in uh, soaked and warm water. And then I put it through the dryer with some laundry and it came out exactly the same size as it went in. However, if you're the least bit nervous about it, it won't hurt to, uh, this doesn't have a real sizing to it. So it won't hurt if you feel, if it'll make you sleep better at night <laughs> to wash it. But I did not pre-wash, uh, pre-shrink mine because I don't feel it needs it. Or you could do the same test. Cut a four inch square out of it, put it through the laundry and the dryer and see if it's still the same size. Can you grab this one? Sure. I think that is beautiful. I was thinking about using that myself. Here's all Mary Berg. Get it up close for you if you're interested in that sort of thing. It's got a lot of the same colors as this one. <laughs> Very cool. You know, you get your like stripe design from further away and then your really cool intricate designs up close. I know there was other ones that I can't um, lumber live go back that far in the comments. Well, the other. here is one we had uh, when we first started the kit for the Island Islander shirt, and I had a lot of people wishing I couldn't find it again. Oh yeah, and I found it. So this one is really nice. It's got yeah. like a navy blue background with different shades of greens. And a little lavender. Yeah, that one is fun because it has a little bit of that like brighter color, but it's not too flashy. Still has the, you know, Hawaiian or tropical feel to it um, without being too loud because I know some people don't like that. This Same the, with this one. This one I made for my husband and everywhere we go he gets compliments on it. It's tropical without being too in your face. It's not a hundred different colors. It's not all over the place. It's got a lavender against a black and almost like a gray. There's a gray. Gray, lavender, and black is pretty much the colors on this one. But remember, I put the crayons on the photos. Yep. So you can see by our color coding of the crayons what colors these are. And these are all available in the Islander shirt kit, too. Did we find out? Did we show the right fabrics now? I um, maybe she left. Okay. Um, feel free to send us a message, and we could try to look those up for you if there's something specific you're interested in. Um, okay, so... Just to follow up, um, if you joined late on the announcements from the beginning, I will run through them very quickly. Um, don't forget to post your everybody shirt by November 15th. We will pull a winner or more um, on November 16th. I know a lot of people have already posted them. Um, make sure to go over there and check out. It's on our Facebook page. Um, it's under community or, or post by others or something like that. Um, and it depends on what you're on and what Facebook feels like calling it on that particular day. Um, but I know there's a lot of everybody's shirts right now. Yes. There's also other stuff, too, that people are showing off, which is when I say show off, I mean in the best way possible because that's what we want. We want you to show off what you're making. We want to be inspired by you. And I think Cassie is or already did post her Morticia Adams costume mm -hmm. that Layla, Layla, that Janet wanted to see. And Leslie, that's where the L came from, um, was posting hers as well. Yeah. But she made a costume. Um, so, yeah, post your shirts. Go check it out. See what everybody else is making. The Aquino and the Coca are on clearance. Check those out. We talked about the Tropical Lawns. We have a bunch of 
bunch more knit jersey made in the USA on the website if you're looking for that. And when you just go to the fabric page and hit knits, you'll see in each one that it'll it'll say made in the USA. And most of the ones we have now are. So that's kind of fun. Community. Leslie said she found it under community and hers is a Mary Poppins oh. costume. Um, butter patterns, all two dollars. There we've run quite a few sales on those, but now we're down to two dollars while they last. Get them while the getting's good. And, and post your Halloween costume them. pictures. Yeah, if you made your Halloween costume, let's we'd love to see or those somebody too. else's. Yes, which is what Jessica's doing. I need today. to go right now and finish. <laughs> Speaking of hoods, I need to. All right. Well, this was I fun. Know. I hope that uh, we've uh, got you inspired and ready to start cutting out your easy shirt. If you have questions on posting your photos or finding the photos from other people on Facebook, feel free to send an email or a message on Facebook. If you have any questions specifically about the pattern, your purchase, shipping, uh fabric products email islander sewing at comcast.net and if you forget that just go to the about us page and at the very bottom you'll find yep. the email address again all right so everybody have a great week happy cutting um and cutting, marking and interfacing and interfacing and if you want that matching play ads um, video, it is in the comments or you can find it on our YouTube channel. And it's never too late to get a kit. So double check well, even if you're watching unless this. We're out. Unless we're out. But we tried a lot of our kits we are maintaining. Um, of course, with this one, more likely to have it in the colder weather time. But um, yeah, if you're watching this at a different time, double check the website. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we've had fun. I hope you did too and learned something. And we will see you next Tuesday. Bye, everybody from Islander Sewing Systems. Have a great week and happy Halloween. Bye.